Well, our hearts have been lifted up to the throne of grace, have they not? And as we've joined our voices together in worshiping the Lord, it's been a, an enlarging experience for my heart as we have worshiped together and sung these anthems of praise. I don't think there's anywhere in the world that this particular group of men would come together in one conference at one time. Uh, as you have come from 70 different countries around the world, as you have come from the various continents and from all across the United States, as we've gathered here intent on one purpose with one mind in one place being of one spirit, uh, we have devoted ourselves to the worship of God and the ministry of His Word. And so as we now come to this session, I do want to ask you to join me and a word of prayer. Father, as we now come to this time to hear yet again from Your Word, I pray that You will magnify Your glory before our eyes, that You will enlarge our confidence in Your Word, that Your promises are yea and amen that You have spoken with an infallible voice that has been recorded and preserved for us in pages of inspired Scripture. And I pray, God, that as we assemble in this conference and even this morning, that You would solidify and stabilize our firm allegiance to the ministry of the proclamation of Your Word. We believe that what the psalmist has said is true, that you have exalted your word above your throne in the heavens, and that you have promised to honor the man and honor the ministry that will honor your word. It is your word that tells us of the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is your word that sets on display before our watching eyes by faith the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of Your love for us in Christ. And so as we gather this day, Lord, I pray that You would do a significant work in our hearts, that this would not be just one more conference or one more meeting or one more session, but that You would, you would go deep into our soul and that You would anchor us in Your Word and that for the rest of our lives, our ministries will be faithfully devoted to expounding Your truths. You have said that Your church is the pillar and support of the truth. And in this hour and in this day and this generation, I pray that we would faithfully uphold sound doctrine and that we would earnestly contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Lord, I pray that You would come alongside each and every man here today and that You would strengthen him and fortify him and encourage him, that You would open the windows of heaven and pour out Your grace upon every one who is gathered here today. We are reminded of the words of our Lord, apart from me, you can do nothing. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears these words of mine and acts upon them is like a very wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, it did not fall because it was built upon the rock. And he who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them is a very foolish man who has built his house upon the sand. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, great was its fall because it was built upon the sand. Lord, by Your enabling grace, incline our hearts even more to build upon the rock of the revelation that has been entrusted to us in Your inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word. Father, we pray this in the name that is above every name, the name of Him who is the living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Amen. I have just one bit of unfinished business from yesterday. Uh, Many of you, if not most of you, were in my session as I spoke on William Tyndale. And I neglected to say to you something very important. I held up this Tyndale Bible. We believe it's 1534. This is the greatest masterpiece in the English language. I I have seen the crown jewels in the Tower of London. This is the real crown jewel. It's the Word of God translated into our language. If there is an evangelical Ark of the Covenant, (laughs) this is it. (laughs) 1525, Tyndale was in Cologne, Germany, attempting to make his first published New Testament. There was a raid on the print shop. At the time of Matthew 22, verse 12, he had to gather up his materials, head to the Rhine River, get on a boat, come downstream to Worms, Germany, where Tyndale would try to complete the work. It was where Martin Luther, in 1521, April 18th, stood at the Diet of Worms and gave his great defense of the Word of God. Tyndale knew there there were Luther sympathetic people there. And in 1526, he completed the first ever English translation from the original Greek into English. Eight years later, in 1534, He produced this. There is only one in the world of 1525 up to Matthew 22, 12. There are about seven in the world of 1526. There is but a very small number of 1534. Tyndale made somewhere between 4,000 to 5,000 corrections. He was committed to the best translation he could possibly pull together. And he produced this. There would be one more quick revision in 1535. He would be martyred in 1536, the same year John Calvin came to Geneva. One man steps off the scene, and God raises up the next man. This book will be on display just outside the doors. You may never have a chance again to be this close to, I think, the greatest treasure in the English language. I would encourage you to go by and take a look, for it is truly a priceless treasure. I want to speak to you this morning on the invincible power of the inerrant Word. We understand what the word inerrant means. It means that the Bible is without any errors as it was recorded in its original autographs. And this is a flawless book in all that it states. Psalm 12, verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times, meaning refined to absolute perfection. It is a flawless book in all that it states. Psalm 119, verse 140, Your word is very pure. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is tested, meaning it has been put into the fire. There are no impurities that remain. It is the pure gold and silver of the truth of God. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 17, your word is truth. The word truth means reality. It means the way things really are. It means not that which the culture or the population says something is. It's not how it is perceived by us. 
The word truth means reality. It means the way things really are. And sin is whatever God says sin is. Salvation is whatever God says salvation is. Heaven and hell is whatever God says something is. Let every man be found a liar. Let God be found true. In James 1, verse 25, the Scripture is referred to as the perfect law. In 1 Peter 2, verse 2, the Bible represents itself as, quote, the pure milk of the Word. That is to say, it is unadulterated and it is unvarnished. The Bible says in Hebrews 6, verse 18, it is impossible for God to lie. I have retranslated this from the original language, and this is what it literally means. It is impossible for God to lie. It means what it says, and it says what it means. Titus 1, verse 2 says, God who cannot lie. But there are some things that God cannot do, and God can never contradict Himself. And it is impossible for God to lie because God is truth, and His Son is the truth, and the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth, and the Word of God is the Word of truth. Concerning such an inerrant Bible, the prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, said, if I do not believe in the infallibility of Scripture, the absolute infallibility of it from cover to cover, I would never enter the pulpit again, close quote. And so it is for all of us who are gathered here today who minister the Word of God, if we did not believe in the inerrancy of the Word of God, we would never enter a pulpit again. And because the Word of God is inerrant, it is therefore by necessity invincible. Because the Word of God is absolutely pure, it is therefore absolutely powerful. Because the Bible is what it claims to be, it is able to do what it claims to do. Now, the word invincible means incapable of being overcome or subdued. It means incapable of being conquered or debated, such as the supernatural power of the Word of God. And the Bible is so invincible, so invincible that it requires many different symbols to communicate the whole of its power. It's like the Bible is like a, a beautiful diamond that has many different cuts, and when you hold it up to the light, each beauty is refracting the light out of each different side, and no one symbol of the Bible can communicate the whole, so it requires many different metaphors, many different analogies to even begin to try to put its arm around the totality of the invincible power of the inerrant Word. And so what I want to do for us together in this session is set before you but seven symbols of sacred Scripture, seven metaphors, seven analogies that are found in the Bible itself, how the Bible represents itself to us. I would encourage you to write these down. I would encourage you to write these in the back of your Bible. I would encourage you to preach this outline. I would encourage you to, to teach this as a lesson. Seven symbols of the sacred Scripture. I want you to think with me first from Hebrews chapter 12, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13. Number one, the Word of God is a sword that pierces. It's not a Q-tip that tickles. <laughs> it is a sword that pierces. It is not a feather. It is a sword. And if the Word of God is not a sword in your hand, you are not preaching the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 12, I want to look at verses 12 and 13, and I want you to note with me first what the Bible is, and then second, what the Bible does. 
Four things what the Bible is at the beginning of verse 12. Number one, it is the divine word. It says, for the word of God. It's not the word of man. It's not the word of culture. It's not the word of society. It's not the word of tradition. It's not the word of religion. It is the word of God. It has come down to us from above. It has not originated from within us or from within this world. It has come down from the throne of God above. It is the Word of God. Not only is it the divine Word, second, it is the living Word. It says, for the Word of God is living. That is to say, it is alive. It speaks in this very hour. In fact, across the page in Hebrews 3, verse 7, please note the verb tense of this. It says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes from Psalm 95, verse 7, not said, past tense, what the Spirit says through His Word, present tense. This book is alive. In fact, that is the emphasis that is made by the writer here in the, in the original language. The order of the words is this, living for the Word of God is. It's put in the emphatic position. It's as if the author of the book of Hebrews has taken a yellow highlighter and underscored the word living. That should jump off the page to us today. This isn't just an ancient book. This isn't just an old book. This book is alive. Martin Luther said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has hands. It runs after me. Or it has feet, it runs after me. I was translating out of the German at that, <laughs> at, at that point. I know when you're laughing with me and when you're laughing at me. It has feet, Luther says. The Bible runs after me. It has hands. It, it lays hold of me. Surely this book has grabbed you by the lapels. Surely this book has laid hold of your heart. Jesus said in John 6, verse 63, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Every other book in reality is a dead book unless it contains the living Word of God. And because this book is living, it is the most relevant book. It speaks to every age, to every generation, on every continent, in every place. It's been well said this book is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. You want to have a contemporary ministry? Great. Preach the Bible. It's the most contemporary, relevant message that there is. And then third, it says it's active. This word active in ergase means energetic. It's full of energy. This, this book's never flat. There have been many times I've walked into a pulpit like this and I've been tired physically, emotionally, mentally. But this book's never been tired. And when I open this book and begin to preach this book, the energy of this book begins to surge through my soul and it begins to surge through your soul as you stand up to preach this book. Now, this book is never tired. This book is never listless. This book is active. This book is always at work in the world. Now, this book never takes a day off. This book is never on sabbatical. This book never needs a rest. This book is active, and when you preach this book, it continues to work even after you go home and you go to sleep. The Word of God continues to carry out its work in the, in the hearts of people. And then fourth, it says, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the Word of God. It is living, it is active, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. In fact, it is the sharpest weapon in any arsenal in the world. No surgeon's scalpel can even compare with its cutting power. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, there, there's not a dull side in the Bible. It cuts both ways. Uh, there's not a, a flat book in the canon of Scripture. Uh, there's not a dull chapter. Uh, there is not a blunt verse. Every verse in the entire Bible is razor sharp and can cut and make a penetrating cut. That's what the Bible is. 
And you should never go into the pulpit unarmed. But note what it does. That's what it is. Note what it does. First of all, it's, it's piercing. Do you see that in the middle of verse 12? And piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit. This book is so razor sharp that it penetrates through the outward facades of men and women. It cuts through the excuses that they would hold up. It plunges in, into the depth of the, of the heart. It cuts to the core of the inner person and gets to the bottom of one's life. Every other human message is superficial. It just lays on the surface. It massages the ego. It may stroke the temple, but this book plunges down into the depth of a person's soul. It gets beneath the surface. It does not inflict a mere flesh wound, but it plunges into the vital organs, down into the heart. And note second, not only piercing, but judging, and is able to judge. There is the sufficiency of Scripture. It is able. It is more than able. It is able to judge. Kritikos, meaning critique or critic. The Scripture is able to critique perfectly the human heart. It is able to judge the soul and to render the divine verdict. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And it is the ministry of this sharp two-edged sword that is able to penetrate and to judge what no one else can see, what you alone know about yourself, or perhaps what has not even yet been made known to you by the Word. It gets so far down deep into the crevices of your soul and into the depths of your spirit that it is able to judge the thoughts, those secret thoughts and intentions, the inner desires, the personal ambitions, the driving motives, the deepest attitudes, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's how razor sharp the Word of God is. And note verse 13. Note the first word of verse 13, and, meaning what is found in verse 13 continues with the same flow of verse 12. It connects verse 12 and verse 13 together, and there is no creature, no one in your congregation, no one in your ministry, no one in your house, no one who is sitting under the sharp two-edged sword. There is no creature hidden from His sight. God who is omniscient and knows all things and sees into the inner thought life, there is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open. And in this context, what this is saying is that God sees into the inner heart long before the piercing Word cuts into the soul to peel back the layers of a man's heart, and as the Word is ministered, we are enabled to see ourselves as God sees us. We are able to see something of what God sees when God looks into the depths of our heart. There was no creature hidden from His sight, but all things, please note, all things, action, attitude, thoughts, intentions, motives, attitudes, all things are open, out in the open, because of the ministry of the Word of God. It exposes everything. And this word for open is a a Greek word, gymnos, from which we derive the English word gymnasium or gymnastics. 
And when you would go to a gym in the first century, you would strip down as you would exercise and pump weights and, and, and run and, and all of the like so that there would be no restrictions, nothing of even clothing that would hold you back from full extension of all of the limbs so that you could truly work out. This Word says it is the Word of God that strips us down and makes us naked before a holy God, and we are allowed to see ourselves for the very first time as God sees us. This Word strips away all pretenses, all excuses, all cover-ups, all fig leaves, and leaves the human soul naked before God. And note the next words, and laid bare. We are stripped down and then laid bare under the piercing two-edged sword. And these words, laid bare, trachelidzo. You can hear the word tracheotomy. It means to seize by the neck. It means to expose the throat or neck of a victim for killing. And they would take the sacrificial lamb and pull back the neck, and the priest would take the knife and slit the throat and bring the death blow to the sacrificial animal. And that is what the Word of God does. It renders the death blow to pride. It renders the death blow to self-righteousness and self-sufficiency and, and self-flattery. Laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Or better, to whom we must give an account or literally, to whom is our word, or to whom we must answer to, or to whom we must give an answer. It is the Word of God that establishes our direct accountability to God as it cuts down into the depths of a person's soul. And no one will ever be saved apart from such heart-rending conviction and exposure of the soul before God, to leave one in a sense of conviction of sin and a desperate and dire need for a Savior and His grace to perform open-heart surgery and to give me a new heart. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter unsheathed the sharp two-edged sword and he wielded it, and in Acts 2, verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, after Peter has said, Listen, you men of Galilee, hearken unto me. This is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel 2, verse 28 to 32. Then he goes to Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. Then he goes to Psalm uh, 134. Then back to Psalm 16, 8 through 11, and then for the crescendo, he goes to Psalm 110, verse 1. Scripture, 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 making these thrusts to the hearts of those. And when they heard this, it reads, they were pierced, katanuso. They were deeply pierced to the heart. And the word means to stab as with a knife. Men, I call upon us as we minister the Word of God to take up the sharp two-edged sword. It is the invincible weapon of the minister. Never enter the pulpit unarmed. Unsheath the sword. Wield the sword of the Spirit. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Put down all other plastic forks. Put down all other butter knives. Put down all human crafted utensils. And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is number one.
Sounds like you're sitting on your sword. <laughs> it is the sword that pierces. You need the sword, the sword to pierce in your ministry. You don't need to have a back-slapping, ego-massaging, palm-greased ministry. You need the sharp, two-edged sword. Second, it is a mirror that reveals. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 23. And I want you to note, second, that once the heart is opened up, and the chest cavity is, is made bare before God by the, the plunging sword of the Spirit. Now the mirror of the Word is held up. In James 1, verse 23, we read, For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer… So we're talking about the Word of God. And he is saying, if anyone hears but does not heed… He is like, it's, it's an analogy, he is like a man who looks at his natural face, watch this, in a mirror. It, he is likening the Word of God to a mirror. And what do you do with a mirror? A mirror gives you self-knowledge. A mirror enables you to see yourself as you truly are. A mirror tells it like it is. A mirror gives a true reflection and revelation of what's on the inside. There is a real sense I never truly knew myself until I began to read the Word of God. I was born in 1951, that baby boomer age. I, I grew up in a Norman Rockwell type of home. I was the firstborn child. My parents doted on me. My mother loved me. My father loved me. My mother adored me. My wife's still trying to correct that. <laughs> On top of that, my mother's sister lived with us as I grew up. I had two mothers. They catered to me. They did everything for me. They affirmed me. They praised me. And then I played football, basketball, baseball, ran track. I went to pep rallies, would stand in front of the student body, be given trophies. The cheerleaders would cheer your name. Went off to college, played football. The sororities cheer your name. But then I began to read my Bible, and I wasn't quite what everyone else was saying. I had, when I went to college, I had a living Bible, not the Hebrews 4.12, <laughs> but the old living Bible, that's all I had. I only had a New Testament. It was a living Bible with pictures. It, it was. It had pictures of athletes running that would be spliced into the New Testament. And I took that book wherever I went. And I would go to class, and I would sit in the hall and lean back against the, the wall, and I would just read my Bible, and I had felt-tip pens, and I was… I, I didn't… Eat, I had no commentary. I had no study Bible. I had no Christian book whatsoever under heaven. All I had was a Bible and several colors of a felt pen. And I just read through my New Testament week after week after week after week. I would take it to the dorm. I would take it to football practice. I would take it to the dining hall. And as I read this book, 
it was like someone was reading my heart and someone was doing inventory of my soul. And this book was not cheering and applauding me in the sense of flattering me. This book was giving me the accurate picture within my soul of who I truly am and my dire need for grace. You and I need to be holding up the mirror as we preach. And you and I need to be standing behind that mirror and people not seeing us but looking into this mirror and seeing themselves. There's been many a time after I've preached, I'll be out in the lobby and I can see out of my peripheral vision over in the corner a shy man whose wife has made him come to church. And he's waiting for everyone to leave so he can come up to me privately. And I'll see him coming, and he'll come up to me, and he will say this after he has heard the preaching of the Word of God. Have you been talking to my wife? (laughs) Because it seems that I know more about him than what he knows about him. And I will say, no, I I have not spoken to your wife at all. He will say, yes, you have. And I will say, no, I have not spoken to your wife. But the Word of God is like a mirror that reveals yourself to yourself. Listen, no one will ever be saved until they see themselves for who they are and what they are, and no one will ever be continually sanctified without continually looking into the perfect law of liberty and seeing the the estimate of God and where there needs to be improvements and where there needs to be repentance and where there needs to be mid-course correction. It's a mirror that reveals in every verse. I, I, I was preaching not long ago in my church that I pastored, and and I preached what I thought was one of the most um, soft messages I think I've ever preached. I was preaching through 1 Corinthians 13, I came to love is patient, and and I I was almost apologizing to my own heart for for preaching love is patient. I thought this is going to have no effect on anyone. It was like the application, go into all the world and smile. You know, and I was just praying the Lord would not come back while I'm preaching, love is patient. (laughs) But at the end, I spoke of how Christ is the personification of this virtue of love and how patient He has been toward us and that God is not willing that any of His elect should perish, but that all should come to repentance and, and faith. And as soon as I finished that message, there was a man who had come in, I'd never met him before, and he made a bolt to the pulpit. I couldn't even get out of the pulpit, he was in the pulpit with me. (laughs) And he had that look where God had a hold of him. And I said, let's come down to the front pew, and we sat down, and he said, I've come to church today by myself because no one in my family will come with me because I am so impatient and because I'm so domineering and overbearing and over the top and you have spoken of God's patience towards us in Christ and the need that I have to be patient and there on the front pew of the church as after everyone had left the sanctuary that man was born again it was the word that revealed himself to himself and listen you can talk about the culture and society and give book reviews and quote poems and talk about movies and television shows and all the rest and it has in most uh, times the opposite effect But when you hold up the Word of God as a mirror, people see themselves and they see their dire need for grace, and they come to Christ. Third, not only is the Word a sword and a mirror, but third, it is a seed. I want you to come to 1 Peter chapter 1 and and verse 
and verse 23. 1 Peter 1, verse 23. And I want you to see that the Word of God is a seed that germinates. It is a seed that regenerates. It is a seed that reproduces. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verse 23, you have been born again. Stop right there. The you refers to, to all the believers who are scattered abroad that he mentions in chapter 1, verse 1. And he says to these true believers, you have been born again. It's a passive, perfect participle, which means this has already happened in the past, and they were passive, and someone acted upon them. This is what we call a sovereign regeneration. Uh, this is a monergistic regeneration. It is, it is God acting upon the spiritually dead soul, and you have been born again. The new birth is the life of God in the soul of a man. It is the spiritually dead soul now becoming the recipient of the life of God. And a person becomes a new creature in Christ, and the old things passed away, and behold, new things have come, and you have received a new life in Christ, totally unlike anything you have ever experienced to this point. In fact, it is eternal life that has come into the soul, and it is the life of the ages to come in the soul. Heaven comes to us before we ever go to heaven. And he says, you have been born again. And he gives a negative denial, then a positive assertion. First, the negative denial. This is how you were not born again. Not of seed which is perishable. A perishable seed can only reproduce a life after its own kind. Apple seeds do not produce bowling alleys. <laughs> apple seeds produce apple trees and the fruit of apple. There's a fundamental principle in life. Like produces like. So he says, you were born again, not a seed which is perishable. Eternal life is not by a perishable seed that only gives temporal life. No. He says, but. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says, praise God for the buts in the Bible. <laughs> but. Imperishable, and we would add the word seed. A seed is a remarkable thing. A seed contains an embryo of a plant within it ready to be germinated for propagation. Within a seed, there is the ability to reproduce. It is capable of germination. And he says that we have been born again of imperishable seed. That, and what is this seed? He says that is through the living and enduring Word of God. A supernatural life comes only from a supernatural seed. Eternal life only comes from a seed that is living and enduring. Listen, it would be easier to grow oak trees by planting marbles than for someone to be saved without the planting of this imperishable seed into the prepared soil of their hearts. And Jesus spoke of this in Luke 8 and verse 5. He says, the seed is the Word of God that it is living is what Hebrews 4.12 said, that it is enduring, means it never perishes, it never dies, and it produces a life that never perishes and never dies. Jesus said in John 11, verse 25, though you die, you will live forever. It is by this inspired and errant Word of God that this new birth comes. Now, here's the truth about your ministry. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. And if you sow a worldly message, you will reap a worldly church. And if you sow secular humanism and pop psychology and worldly trends and religious traditions and corporate leadership and cultural ideologies and philosophical thoughts, 
and personal experiences and political commentary, you will reap an unconverted church. But if you sow the living and enduring Word of God under the auspices of the sovereignty of God who alone can cause that seed to germinate, you will have a regenerate church. Spurgeon said, I would rather speak five words out of this book than 50,000 words of the philosophers. If we want revivals, we must revive our reverence for the Word of God. And if we want conversion, Spurgeon said, we must put more of God's Word into our sermons. Did you hear that? Less of you, more of God. Fourth, the Word of God is milk that nourishes. While you're in 1 Peter, while we're in the neighborhood, look at chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And once one has been sovereignly regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God, causing the seed of the Word to spring, spring forth with life. He says in verse 2 of 1 Peter 2, he talks about now the spiritual growth of the one who is born again. And he makes another analogy. And he says, like newborn babes, all believers are to always be like newborn babes. You are, you are to never outgrow being like a newborn babe. You, you never advance to a place of spiritual maturity that anyone in your ministry nor you who serve are to be beyond being like a newborn babe. You are to be always craving the Word of God like a baby craves for milk. And so he says, like newborn babies, long for. That means to cry out, to crave, to intensely desire, to have this singular dominant thirst for. Like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word. And there's the inerrancy of Scripture, the pure milk. And milk is the primary source of nutrition. Uh, milk is able... Babies are able to digest milk before they can digest other kinds of food. Milk contains antibodies that provide protection from disease. Milk has nutrients that, that cause growth. As we minister the Word of God, we must be feeding our people the milk of the Word. It is a dynamic spiritual growth stimulant. No one's spiritual development will advance beyond their intake of the Word of God. None of us will live up to all of the Word of God that comes into us, but none of us will advance beyond the measure of the Word of God that is flowing into us like milk. And he gives us the reason why in verse 3, so that, here is why, purpose statement, so that by it, and the by here means by the means of the Word of God. Here is the ordinary means of grace. By it, you, referring to all those born again, you may grow, meaning develop, mature, advance, increase in godliness in respect to salvation. And the salvation here refers to sanctification. And the Word is to be taken up and digested, and it produces spiritually strong bones and healthy hearts and a strong immune system that is able to fight off spiritual diseases. How shall a young man keep his way pure? How shall an old man keep his way pure? How shall an old woman keep her way pure? How shall a teenager keep his or her way pure, by keeping it according to your word. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. It is the word of God treasured in our heart that enables us to resist temptation. You remember Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days, 40 nights? At the end of that is the climactic three temptations. I think the text indicates he was 
tempted and tested for the entirety of that experience. And these are the final three climactic temptations as the devil throws the artillery of hell against the sinless Son of God. Command that these stones become bread. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. And with each advance, Jesus unsheaths the sword of the Spirit and repels the advances and the temptations of Satan by the Word of God. This is how you and I will remain faithful in our pursuit of holiness, by the grace of God and by the Word of God. Fifth, it is a lamp that shines. Come to Psalm 119, verse 105. And what we are doing is setting before us the different symbols of Scripture. What an incredible instrument of grace is the Word of God. It is a sword that pierces. It is a mirror that reveals. It is a seed that germinates. It is milk that nourishes. It is a lamp that shines. Psalm 119, verse 105, you know this text very well. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Three things I want to tell you about that verse very quickly. Number one, we live in a very dark world. And it is becoming darker by the moment. There are many dangers and many perils and many snares that threaten the safety of all who travel the, the narrow path that leads to life. And many travelers have, have suffered disaster on their way to glory. We live in a dark world, and we need light to see our way and to see the, the bends in the road and to see the dangers that are lurking there for us. And second, not only do we live in a dark and dangerous world, but the Word of God is a lamp giving necessary light for all the travelers. Listen, this lamp is not an option for a few of us. It is a necessity for every one of us. And the light shines brightest in the darkest hour of the night. And this lamp of God's Word has never shined any brighter than it is shining in this very hour in which you and I live. As we live in this sinful and adulterous generation, as we live in times that are virtually unprecedented on many levels, it is the Word of God that is shining the light before our path and revealing the way. And as we stand in pulpits and stand behind lecterns and as we minister the Word of God, we are to be holding forth the light. Proverbs 6, verse 23 says, the commandment, the commandment is a lamp. The teaching is light. You're to be a torch bearer. Psalm 19, verse 8, the commandment of the Lord is, is pure, enlightening the eyes. 2 Peter 1, verse 19, the prophetic word, more sure, is a lamp shining in a dark place. Dr. MacArthur has shared with me the number one thing that people say to him after he preaches. What do you think it is? Oh, I see it now. And the light is shining as we open the book and people see with a Christian worldview, and people see through a Christian lens, and they, they, they see now with, 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 with light shining in a, in a dark age. And the third thing that I want you to note, it says, your word is a lamp to my, please note, feet. And the emphasis here is not on the head, not on the ears, not on the heart, but it's on the feet. Now, that presupposes it's come into the head, and it's come by the eyes or by the ear, 
And it presupposes that this light has shined into the heart, but it doesn't stop there, does it? And it's not real until it affects the feet. And what we learn, we must live and put it into practice. And he says, your word is a lamp to my feet. James Montgomery Boyce writes, we do not know how to live our lives, but the Bible shines on the path before us to expose the wrong, dangerous ways we might take and light up the right way. It is the inerrant Word that gives infallible guidance. Spurgeon said, everything in the railway system depends upon the accuracy of the signals. When these signals are wrong, that life will be sacrificed. And on the road to heaven, we must have unerring signals, or the catastrophes will be far more terrible. And there is only one source that gives infallible signals and inerrant guidance. And it is the lamp of the Word of God that we hold forth. Your church, your pulpit, your lectern, your class needs to be the brightest place in town. Your ministry needs to be shining brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above, piercing the darkness. Sixth, the Word of God is a fire that consumes. Turn back to Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 29. Jeremiah 23 and verse 29, and we read that the Word of God is a powerful instrument like fire that consumes. In Jeremiah 23 verse 29, in this section dealing with false prophets, God is the speaker. Jeremiah is the secretary. And God declares, and Jeremiah records this question from the lips of God. Is not my word like a fire? That is a rhetorical question the answer of which is so obvious, God will not even answer the question. Because if you have two brain cells that are touching between your ears, <laughs> you know the answer. And it is a powerful form of communication. This is not a question, this is a statement. Is not my word like a fire? Now, there are many positive Uses of fire, it gives light, it gives heat, it gives energy, you can cook with it. But this is intended in a very negative fashion in this sense. It is this fire that consumes and burns up. All that with which it comes in contact that is resistant to the Word of God. In this larger context, in this chapter, if I could just draw it to your attention very quickly, the reference is to, in verse 25, prophets who prophesy falsely. In verse 26, prophets who speak out of the deception of their own heart. Verse 27, prophets who make God's people forget God's name. And verse 28, prophets who relate their dream and have, that have nothing to do with God's Word. In verse 30, God is against these prophets. Verse 31, again, God is against these prophets. Verse 32, God is against these prophets. Verse 34, God will punish these prophets and all who follow their abominable message. And God Himself is a consuming fire and God's Word is like a fire, and God promises judgment and will consume all that is not built upon the solid rock of His Word. Earlier in Jeremiah 5 and verse 14, God says, Behold, I'm making My Word in your mouth fire, and the people would, and it will consume them, 
And the message that Jeremiah had from God for the people of his generation was a message of fire that will consume all unbelief, and it will bring the fire of judgment for all who do not turn to the Lord and repent of their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. This too is a part of our message. This too is opening this book and preaching the Word. Because the message that we preach will cause people either to be blessed or to be burned. And they will either be on fire or in the fire. They will either be on fire for God or they will be in the fire of God and there is no mediating position in between. And how we need again in this hour and this day men who will stand up and preach like Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God, while we preach the grace and the mercy of God. But we need Romans 1 as much as we need Romans 3. It's not either or, it's both and. And the Word of God is a consuming fire, and it will consume all those who are in unbelief. This is a red-hot book, my friend. The Scriptures are sizzling. It is the hottest message this world has ever heard. And when you're called to preach, you're called to play with fire. Finally, the Word of God is not only a fire that consumes But in this very same text, in verse 29 of Jeremiah 23, it is a hammer that shatters. It is a hammer that shatters. There is no force in the world that compares with the shattering power of the Word of God to overcome all resistance in the day of His power. In Jeremiah 23, verse 29, God again is the speaker. Jeremiah is the secretary and the recorder. This is a dictation. These are my words, God says. Write it down, Jeremiah. Deliver it to the people. Put it in the Scripture. For every generation to hear this is not my word like a hammer which shatters a rock. This is another rhetorical question, the answer of which is an affirmative yes. It is an amen. It is yea, verily, amen. It is a statement that the Word of God is like a hammer that shatters a rock. It is like a sledgehammer. And little weak men stand in a pulpit with a sledgehammer. And they bring the force of the Word of God to bear upon the heart that is resistant, and it shatters pride and it crushes and smashes self-righteousness. In this verse, rock is not my word like a hammer which shatters a rock. The rock are the false prophets mentioned in the previous verses and in the following verses, and it also refers to those who are in allegiance with the message of the false prophets. These false teachers and false followers are like a rock. They are hard-headed. They are hard-hearted. Their foreheads are like flint. They are uncircumcised of heart. They have a heart of stone that is resistant to the truth of God. Their lives and their hearts are unresponsive to the things of God. They are spiritually dead. They are like a rock. And how will they ever be brought to humility before the throne of grace. How will they ever be brought low before God? And it is by this invincible weapon, the Word of God. It breaks down all resistance in the day of God's power. This hammer is harder than the hardest heart. This hammer is harder than the thickest forehead. This heart is harder, or this hammer is harder than the stoniest soul and the most rock-like unbelief. It is this hammer that administers the death blow to self and smashes self-trust 
and brings a man or a woman to the place of humility before God and to call upon His name for the grace and mercy that He needs. This is the invincible power of the inerrant Word. I call you this day to wield the sword, to hold forth the mirror, to scatter the seed, to serve the milk, to hold up the lamp, to spread the flame, to swing the hammer, and stop with the secular wisdom in the pulpit, and cancel the entertainment in the church, and fire the drama team. If you can't preach, get a drama team. Get rid of the shtick. Unplug the colored lights. Put the pulpit back in the center of the building. Stand up like a man. Open the Bible. Lift it up, let it out, and let it fly. It is the invincible power of the inerrant Word. Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray that You would intensify our confidence in this book, that we would no longer be effeminate in our preaching of the Word, that we would man up, and that we would take the Word, and that the fullness of the power of the Word of God would be unleashed through our ministries that we would unsheath the sword all the way down to swinging the hammer, and that the Word of God would be like milk and would feed and seed that would germinate in all of our ministries in these days. Father, we pray this in the mighty name of Him who is seated at Your right hand, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen.